All right, we'll get started this morning, and, and Todd kind of summed up this entire session with that, uh, how the gather goes, so goes the day. But how we get the gather and the cattle to working for us, I think, is, is kind of where the whole stockmanship and being effective in what you do, that discussion uh, comes into play. But when we're talking about gathering cattle, or at least starting cattle, and, you know, these heifers are not bouncing off the wall, so there's not a whole lot of... Uh, flat to the heifers, but they, I don't know how they work. We've not worked them yet, so we'll see how that uh, goes in just a moment. They're certainly not afraid of horses. They, they may be more responsive on foot than they are on horses. You never know till you start working cattle and you don't know what their background or history might be. Now your cows at home, you kind of know what they're used to. And, and we're gonna do this horseback and on foot, but uh, the whole discussion around whether you can use ATVs or other means of transportation uh, other methods to get cattle gathered, of course you can. It's just a matter of how you use the tool you've got and the best way to do that. Uh, we've got yearlings here, just the primary reason it's easier to haul them three hours than it is a set of pairs and have them bawling all during the session. But there's some things unique, I think, to pairs that we need to talk about. We talked about this yesterday as well. Is if you're gonna start a gather, normally you wanna start gathering cow-calf pairs pretty early in the morning before they bed their calves down is actually easier. Uh, if you can go out around, and I've heard Kurt tell his story, and I've seen my dad do it as many times in the past as well, but if you'll go out and, and just start making some motion and movement around the cows, they tend to go back to their calves. If you start trying to push them off or call them off, they'll walk away from their calves a lot of times, particularly if they've bedded them down for the day or the morning. So there's things to think about in getting those cows up, letting them mother up first, and then taking the cow-calf pairs. The other thing you can do is start a little earlier than that, and as soon as you have pairs, teach that cow and calf to, to drive off of pressure or move off pressure. And so anytime you show up and start trying to move them, the cow and the calf know that they're supposed to go together. That's one of the downsides to calling cows. Uh, if you use uh, some, some feed to bait them in, uh, they're kind of like anything else. You get enough feed in front of them, they're gonna go off and leave uh, their family behind to go get it. And so we need have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, if you are gonna use feed to draw cattle to you, one thing you can do before you start that process, and, and we see this a lot of times, if you want the cattle to go way over on this side of the pasture, you'll just go to that side of the pasture and go honking or shake a feed sack and the cattle will all trot over there to you. And I had this discussion yesterday with a young man afterwards, what's happening to him, most of his cows go, most of his calves go, but there'll always be a few cows hang back and the calves will hang with them and then they can't get them in the crowd. So trying to get all those to move as a, unit is kind of what we're after in that gather because I hear that story all the time about the calves being left behind and if you can start cattle right and this is my goal every time I gather cows and calves is to not have the calves at the back when we go through the gate and that's hard to do to get the cows to keep those calves with them as they go forward and go out the pasture but it, when it does happen, it makes you feel pretty good. There might be one or two calves trailing out with them last cows. So that's the goal on the cow-calf pair. And Kirk, you may want to weigh on, in here on any time on the pair side of it as well. But even if you're using a vehicle to move cows, maybe you go to the cows first and just maybe sit there. They're gonna to come to you, but if you don't feed them, what do they do? They'll normally go away and then they can pick their calves up or that they'll more likely to, and then you can start moving them, and move them slow. That's something else we have a tendency to do. We get in a hurry because they will trot following you, right? And so we take off too fast, and we string those cattle out, and the cows lose contact with the calves, and we don't get them all to the crowd at the same time. And what normally happens then, the calves run back to where they were originally bedded down and where they last nursed, and you're left with split pairs and don't get them all worked that day. That's a common thing we hear. So there's ways to work around that. The easiest way I think is either on foot or horseback or even with an ATV. You can go out there and get the cows up, get the calves up and kind of bunch them up, get them, get them paired up before you take off. Uh, I have a young man that works for me in Texas and they use ATVs to rotate pastures in their rotational grazing program. 
but he was having trouble moving his cows with his ATV. They didn't own horses. His dad didn't want to walk, so they were trying to figure out how to do it. And I'd heard about a guy who used a coach's whistle, and that was his signal to get cows to rotate. And didn't, they didn't rotate until he used the whistle. So I told him that in my track, and uh, he saw, was telling me about two months later, he said, that whistle works really good. He said, when we drive out there and we're ready to move cows away from us, we blow the whistle. He used it entirely backwards from what I was thinking, but it signaled those cows that it was different. And so when he blew the whistle, the cows started moving away from them, and then they could keep that motion going. So there's ways to make these tools work. You just got to figure out what works in the best interest of the cattle and trying to get them to move away from pressure and in the direction you want them to go. Um, Horseback to me is a little easier sometimes because you don't have to look at the terrain that you're going over. The horse can do that for you. They can also find cows, they can find caves that might be bedded down somewhere you might not see. Uh, and that is one argument you always hear in the motorized vehicle versus a horse, that is something. Plus you're up higher, you have a higher perspective. You can kind of see what's developing in the, in the area in front of you around the cows and kind of know where motion has started and where it's going to go. But not everybody uses horses, so you got to think about different ways to do that. Uh, on foot, I really like working young pairs on foot because uh, sometimes with a horse, they see a big furry animal, they may actually come to you a little bit, so you got to be real careful not to draw them to you and teach them to actually kind of come away or move away from the pressure and go with their mother. So that's, it takes a little bit of time actually, to, for me, a little more time horseback than it does on foot to teach them to drive with their with the cow. So those are just some tips on the cows. If we don't have any cows here to work with and, and show that aspect, it might be very difficult to do that either. But as we start working these calves in a minute, you know, as Kirk's ride toward, rides over there toward them, what are they doing? It's always fun to me to watch what the cattle are doing as we're over here gammering around and getting ready to go. As he rode toward them and rode away, they all started looking at us. And so they're always ready for us to give them a signal on what we want to do uh, and actually move off pressure. Now that they're not, nobody's over there close to them, they're ready to go back and relax. Kirk, you want to talk anything before we get started? Sure, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I think it's real important, as you said, how to start cattle. And, uh, but we never really got into, I mean, the whistle's really not probably the best way to start cattle. Well, it, it, it works pretty good for him. Well, yeah, okay. Well, that's everything. Uh, so to me, we have to fight this human urge. Like when it's time to eat, when we have these, uh, when the dinner bell rings over here, we're all gonna rush over there. We're all just gonna get right in line and follow each other up through dinner, through the line. Everything that happens here, we do, we get in line. When you got on the buses last night, you all got in line, you got behind each other and you pushed each other up on the bus. And that's uh, kind of what happens with the whistle. You just go in there and you shove the cattle. And the thing is, if you're, if you're trying to gather pairs, the cow has to be able to take your pressure, but keep her mind on her calf at the same time. And if you put too much pressure straight behind her, she's trying to hunt you up, and then she runs off and leaves her calf and loses track. Same thing with yearlings. If you go start a bunch of yearlings and you put too much pressure on the back, they're, they're really not ready to leave. And then you're driving cattle the whole way. But if you start cattle right, I think, you start them where they, the lead starts and they drag the rest of the cattle on. And that's what you call stringing cattle. And if you're shoving from the back and the front doesn't get it, doesn't know they're moving, then you bunch cattle up and they want to kind of do this on you. So what we want to try to do in our gathering, I don't care if it's a little intensive grazing program that you gather in the afternoon, the way you approach those cattle, the angle, and the speed of your approach, the cattle tell you to do that, but that's a, that's a way different way of getting cattle started than just going and starting, coming in behind like we do with a lot of people and just shoving them. And I think that's a really important thing we got to try to figure out. So here, this is not a, if these cattle would have been right here where they were before, we could have had a real nice way to show it how to gather that. And I've been to Ron's place a lot of times and he, he gathers just with this way, you go out, you get to where you're kind of towards the back of the cattle, and that's always depending on where the where you're headed to, where the back of the cattle is. And you start, if these are the cattle, if Ron's the, the herd of cattle, instead of me thinking around, going around behind those cattle, 
I would think about riding right through his hip. That would cause him to go forward. His horse sees me on his left eye. The cow sees me on the left eye. Now he's waiting for me to come through. As I'm right here, he's going to turn his head to the left and he's going to actually start going that way just a little bit. As I ride through, he turned his head back this way and now I've straightened my animal out. Now I ride along and there's more cattle here. I keep a straight line. Everybody starts going forward. I turn and come back. He's moved forward four or five steps. Now I ride right through him again. And now I've created this flow forward from the back, kind of like dominoes. And that movement goes right through the back of your herd to the front. And the front says, oh, we're going somewhere. They have time to make up their mind. And that creates a nice flow to where you're going. Once you get those cattle started, then you want to drive them in a way that keeps their mind on you, but on their destination as well. So once you get them started, you don't want to be behind them so much as on the side. The trottier your cattle are, if they really want to move, then you want to move yourself up farther forward in the herd. If, if you're by yourself or don't have many people. If you, don't, if you have a pretty good crew, you can position yourselves to kind of get the cattle to stay in the formation you want, keep the speed you want. And what I think, one of the great things I think about Texas is that they lead cattle. And they're very, very good at leading cattle. Is that right? I don't know if that's all parts of Texas, but a lot of places I've been, you don't take a bunch of cattle somewhere unless you lead them. And what that does, it teaches those cattle to start hooking on to the person leading them if they do it right, if they're not on their dang cell phone, not paying attention, and they're just in the right position to keep those cattle's mind on them but check their speed up and get it to go. And pretty soon they learn to follow and they'll, they'll hook right onto that. That's a great drawing pressure. And the rest of the crew, all they're trying to do is keep the minds flowing towards the lead. And that to me is a, a real professional way to start cattle. And they learn how to flow and then they want to go where they're going rather than yeah, yeah, hoo, ha, chasing and whapping and making them go. So that's, that's what I think starting cattle right is all about. Now, the, if you have real trotty cattle, the flatter your angle you approach with, the less pressure you're putting on. If you have real gentle cattle, the more steep and the more aggressive your angle is, the more movement you'll put in them. And uh, we had a question here. We, let's, let's go take them out of this corner. We had a question here. Uh, Dean and Todd had a question here the other night of a fella talking about cattle when they get sticky, where they're kind of trotty cattle, they're, they're a little bit nervous, but uh, they get sticky where they just all bunch up and they go. Now, now, uh, we'll, now so I, I've got this one here started. Now, Ron, I'll just wait. I won't do any more. And we'll just start these cattle out of this corner. Now watch, we want, we want them to decide. We don't want these cattle to push over the top. We want them to decide to go first. And then these will come up and send them on along. See, there we got them started now. Now, right there, I got to stay up here. This one wants to keep turning to look at me, but I got to stay up far enough. Now we're just trying to start those cattle. We're keeping them moving. If I go too far back, they'll turn and look at us. So we got to stay up here just in the right spot to keep them moving along. We can't be back there roping cows in the back. We got to keep doing our job up here to keep them moving. But if we get too close, then they'll turn and look back at us. So it's real important how you position yourself. But uh, so, so getting that movement started and keeping that movement going is real important, the way we start that. Good, so that, that's some things. And, and I, I, uh, I think this is one of those skills, starting cattle, that is really, really important. So that fellow was asking about the cattle that bunched up. What they're doing is they're trying to find a hole. They're, they're getting away from the pressure in the bunch. They feel most comfortable in the bunch. So they go hide in the bunch, and then they, they learn that that's a place to hide, but what that does, it stops all your movement. So you've got to figure out how to get some of them parted off and get them leaving and then take the other ones with them so they learn that movement creates more movement and that's what they're supposed to do. I, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day about grazing and, and, the, and the guy was talking about the buffalo days. And you know, in the, the days of the buffalo, there used to be, you know, 500,000 or a million head of buffalo in a herd going across our country. And, and I thought the elk, or the uh, wolves and the grizzly bears kept them moving and created this situation. But what that guy said is the wolves and the elk, or the wolves and the grizzly bears kept the elk and the, the buffalo and the, the grazing animals, they kept them bunched, but their manure and urine kept them moving. 
they didn't want to eat the stuff they defecated on, so they kept moving along, but the grizzly bears and the predators kept them bunched. And that's a natural instinct that's come from those days. So be real careful that you don't teach those cattle just to bunch up and not move. And you'll find Brahma type cattle, they will really get that, that that'll come much quicker than, than our uh, British breeds because they have that survival instinct so much more. So anyway, that's just a thought. And I, you may have a little different opinion on this, but I like to kind of strain cattle out of the bunch quite as much. And I'd say a lot of people really, if they're even if they're leading them, will try to keep the front too slow. And it doesn't have any draw effect on the rest of the herd. So you kind of, that's where the gas pedal kind of comes from. The guy in the front can help pull the cattle forward by giving them a little more room or slow it down if they do get too trotting or trotting away from the rest of the cattle. But if you watch cattle move across a pasture, it doesn't matter how far the ones in the back are away from the herd, they're, they're gonna go the same direction and they'll eventually catch up. So I, sometimes I think we try to bunch them up too much to, so we think we won't lose them, but in fact, that actually makes them harder to, to manage. Yeah, that's that's very good. And, and different different terrain creates different situations that you need. But what I like to see when cattle, when you get like yearlings like these, or what I really like to see when you're moving cattle for profit, not just to be moving them, but just like they're stringing off and going to water somewhere before dark. When you see cattle stringing out to go get water after they've been grazing all day, that's a real nice movement. And usually they string out, they're they're good, and they're not balling each other, and they really. They're kind of stopping and grazing a little bit. And you can create that real nice flow, I think, by the way you start cattle. So always, I think it's real important when you're moving cattle, always try to try to go right through. If you're behind them, you gotta go from one side to the other. So one side to the other. Now, I'll just, you'll see how that creates that movement in these cattle just by riding straight across. Now, here's what happens. A lot of times when we, when we do that, when you ride across, when you ride across, if you turn and go up their side, you'll cause them to turn and look at you, and that stops everything you just did. So what you want to do is they come out across here, I'll, uh, I'll step right in here, ride right through, you'll see they'll all trot right out of here. But I got to get out far enough so they see me this eye, and then come back across here. So when I come straight across here, I'll come straight across, I'll start them. I might even have to back my horse up a little bit through that turn. That's why if you're riding a four-wheeler, you'd want to turn the other direction rather than turn into the cattle because it'll cause them to turn and look at you and you'll slow your flow down. So really important how you work back here. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, the, the ATV is one of those, it took me a long time to realize to either go way out away from them before you turn or you got to turn away from them. And I see a lot of people really turn right into the cattle and they'll, they're always having trouble keeping them going somewhere. And you can, uh, you can probably use more pressure than you think if you use the right kind of pressure. And you probably use, you probably need to use more pressure than you probably maybe do sometimes. But if you pressure in the wrong spot, then any kind of pressure is wrong. So then you start using less. And I think that's a mistake. So that's real nice. They, they made around that corner real nice. And, you know, if we were trying to put them in a the corral or something, that kind of shows the position that we should be in to get that flowing. I'll go ahead and open this gate up. How are you today? I'll go ahead and get this gate open up. We might as well put them through here and run them down this alley. I'll just send them back out to Ron from here, and I won't have to spook these cattle. And they learn how to transition from one spot to another here. So this is a good thing if I can get them to move out of here. I might have to use a little noise, just means I'm far enough away, I can't use my horse, here's a, oh, I'm gonna make it. I don't have to use any noise. I'll try not to use any noise. See, that, that animal right there, he's gonna start the whole, he just changed their old mind, see? He told them, let's get out of here. That, that calf right there, if you can see him, he said, let's get out of here. That, that rolling cart's gonna help me too. So the rolling thunder helped. But you see, just that one animal changed his mind, actually created all these animals going out. And I just gotta keep, now, now he changed his mind out there, so now I gotta change his mind again. I'll just change these guys' mind. They gotta get out here and see him. So now he's thinking about coming back in, so that stopped all the movement out there. Good, now Ron's got him. If he can get to that one. See, this is how precise he can be right there. See that one that's right, the second one from the chute. He's the one that he's gonna change around. Now he backed up. 
and he can't get to him. So now it's my turn to go help. So I'll send these cattle in, they'll bump that one, and that'll put it out there where Ron can have him again. So we're working together here. I, I'm, I'm done now. Ron's got him. All I'm doing is going to keep sending cattle to Ron. He's the lead. I'm going to send cattle to him. Where are you going to go? Across with them and then back, or what do you want? Yeah, let's do that. You're the lead. You go ahead and do whatever you want. Well, I wouldn't turn around and... Okay, good. Good thing we had a plan. Yeah, we made it. Yeah, good. All right, so now we'll just turn around, hold them up. Boy, and this is a great thing to do. I'll tell you, if you want to really get cattle good to go in a corral, let them out of the corral, let them come out, stop them right here, change your mind, let them sit for a minute, turn around and take them back in the corral. All I had to do really to stop them right there was just come down their side like Kirk mentioned a while ago and they were ready to go. Now, they also know that hole right there, same thing, you can stop them from going in that hole. <coughs> I'll let him try to hold me. I'll try to send some maybe around the backside, Kurt, to draw them out, or do you think I'll push them in? Uh, let me change these guys' mind right there. Now we're good, see? Now we're good. We just had to change our mind enough to get them to come around that corner. Now i got to be careful that something doesn't come this side. Ron will have to push them to me, but i got to try to stick. Maybe I'll just go right here. I'll, I'll draw this guy out. Good. Now, now Ron can send them other cattle up, and I can be in a position here to... I didn't want to send these cattle out, which I just did, but it, that's all right. Here we've got multiple ones kind of looking out. I don't know exactly which one's going to try to do what, so I'll just try to get them all slow to turn back around. Now we can start getting the whole flow to turn back to where we need them to go. And once they start, I will to just hold my position, let Kirk put pressure on the front, and send them down the alley. Now, going in a gate like this, a lot of times we will take pressure off or too much pressure off. They've got to commit to going in the crowd. So, so a lot of times you get pretty comfortable thinking they're already in there and you've got your job done. But if one of them turns and comes out because you've taken too much pressure off, uh, they may draw all of them back out just like they did those first two or three that went in there. Why don't you get a hold of these guys when they come out just like we're bringing them out of the corral. And that's a real important thing here. As these cattle trot out of this corral, we want to keep, create this movement in them because they're going to get dull, but Ron's going to be there to take a hold of these guys' mind and tell them that when they come out of the corral, we have control of them. They're not just running off and leaving us. Just like that. And he can see, he just had to back up a few steps. He's trying to hook them on and draw his mind to them, their mind to his and not turn them back to me. See, that's a real, I call that hooking cattle on, and that's just really a nice way to get cattle to settle and be somewhere. And if we want them to just come out slow and keep moving a little bit, I can turn and actually go away from them and keep drawing them forward to keep them slowed down a little bit. So th this way you can stop them, but if you just try to stop them in their tracks, they're, they're probably gonna turn back and go the opposite direction of what you really want. Yep, and I feel that spot right there, letting cattle out of a crow and just letting them run off and get away is a big mistake we make about handling our cattle the next time because that's the last thing they think about is running away from that bad corral. If you'll stop them and hold them up and get their mind thinking that stop your feet, that place and counting cattle are two places where we can undo a lot of good stockmanship. And it's really the same motion right there. When cattle run out that gate, it's no different than when cattle are running by you and jumping and hitting the fence from you trying to count cattle. So you got to set up your spot to count cattle. Uh oh, where are you going? <laughs> I don't know yet. I thought you were in quicksand. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Good. So it's great. And, it, and uh, the problem with these kind of a deals is cattle really will get sticky because there's really nowhere to go in here. And we don't have too many cattle. So it's real nice to put those cattle through the alley and get them moving because then you've, they got to move away from you. They can't just go bunch up. Want to put them through one more time? Yes, sir. And we'll put them through. Now we're in a hurry. We're late. So we'll kind of put them through a little quicker this time, and we'll see what that does. Now you can only go so fast. I'm just trying to bounce them further into that corner so yeah, good deal. we'll get a good idea. They want, we want them to go into that Perfect. alleyway. See? We'll make the first one commit, and I'm just going to hold this position and let Kirk bring them to me. He's putting the pressure. I'm just keeping them on the other side of the gate post. Isn't that nice? So there, we put more pressure on them, they went in better. So sometimes using too little pressure is the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do. Can we step off and get a foot? Yeah. So 
I, I think it's really important to kind of see some different ways, and we might have blown them up too. I, I might have put too much pressure on, and they might all went and spilled back behind us, and then we'd have known we'd put too much pressure on. So now I'll just, uh, I'll send them out here to Ron again, and, and we'll see how they respond on foot. Now coming around this corner, I'm gonna try to be on the right side here, and I'll start these cattle, this is my domino, I want this animal to bump those, and they'll start that movement right up through. That's the kind of movement that we want when we're gathering a herd. The same thing you just saw there. These cattle right here bump those cattle there. Watch how that movement just goes right up through them. See, now they're trotting without me telling them to trot. And that's what I'm talking about with this gather that goes up through the herd. All right, come on, go ahead. I've been talking too much. Uh, the same thing. I'm just going to pick them up here and try to keep drawing them this way if I can without having them turn back toward Kurt. That way we can draw them out, stop them just like we did horseback. It does not matter whether you're on foot or horseback or whatever you want to try to do. So I can kind of help keep drawing these cattle forward. At some point in time, I, and I can release them. If we want to go back to the same place, we can do that. I can come down here and help draw this one around. Start our flow going, we'll draw those into them. It gets pretty easy to move these cattle on foot. I have to be careful not to stay too close to them when I go up their side or I'll stop them. We're doing the same thing we did a while ago, trying to get the front started. If I step in too close, that can come out. And this is why I say a lot of times, if Kurt was further behind and I didn't put too much pressure, and they'll squirt between us. Yeah. And that, we see that all the time when people are gathering and working from behind the herd. Uh, we can really cause those cattle to squirt out. That's the biggest issue I see in a lot of ranches I go to. Everybody just jammed up on them and everybody's putting pressure at the same time. And the cattle don't know who to respond to and they'll try to bolt and get out of there. They have nowhere to go in front of them. So they have to sneak out by the weakest spot out back. We bring them to you. Sure. These, so, little, these little heifers do, they're really nice to work, but the thing I like about these, if you're wrong, they're gonna let you know pretty quick. They're kind of really fun to work. As Kurt's saying, working that alleyway and you're creating that speed and drawing those cattle and kind of getting to the point they want to try to take themselves out. Ron, so as they come around here, I'm going to stay out in front, and you, would you talk about how to turn cattle from the back? Yes, yeah, sir. I'll try. As they come out of here, if I want them to come back to this side over here, I'll try to draw this first one's eye around. If that doesn't work, which it didn't, I'm going to have to walk over here and push those cattle out, but if I want them to turn back to that corner. Now, if I don't want them to go into the corner, I'm going to see if I can do this. I'll try to just turn them here. I don't know if that'll work or not. But as they start in here, if I kind of stay in here behind them, I'm going to start drawing that eye back out this way. There you go. I can get her to look. and See, the problem cattle kind of hook an ear on, but I can keep them from going in the corner by drawing on a hip or drawing on an eye. We used to call it pushing on the hip, but you're really drawing the eye back around. Uh, but position yourself closer to the hip. Now, if they, you lose contact, once again, you can push on an eye on this side. Put a little touch on it. And make them actually make that curve as well. So everything we're doing is about pushing or pulling on an eye and letting them see where we're putting our pressure. Let's hold them up right there. Just there, good, right there. Okay. Right at the water trough. Good. Go ahead. Uh, just, and how we position ourselves, we, know, we talk about this in all the sessions, is where you put pressure, and Kurt's got a great analogy for that, about putting it right there in our BQA spot on the neck. And that's a great, great place to think about putting your pressure and putting your focus. But we're, looking, we're communicating with them through their eyes and, and sometimes through the ear with a little noise. Those Kurt said he wasn't going to use much noise back here because he didn't have to. Everything was based off what they saw, and that was enough pressure to get them to go uh, and move away from that pressure. They don't sense pressure on their body. They sense it through their 
eyes and ears and through the brain. Watch what happens right here. Now, if I want, um, oops, I'm late. She left me. If I want to go up and turn these cattle, and I and I, and I got to, I want to keep them moving, but I want to turn them to the left. As I start up this cow side here, as I start up here to turn them, watch what happens to this leader here. She turns and looks at me, and now her mind is no longer on the moving, but I've just caused her to slow down and stop her feet because she turned her head. So by going up their side to turn them, you might get them turned, but you stopped all their movement. So what Ron was talking about with the, uh, the, the injection side, if I go out here and these cattle, they're starting to veer to the left and I want to turn them to the right, if I go straight out, straight out, straight out, until I can connect with that first one and then I can push her head across, you see, now I haven't slowed movement, I've created movement, I've straightened her out, and now we have, I, I got my cattle straightened out or turned without stopping or slowing their movement. But if you just come up their side like this, they all turn and look at you with both eyes and that slows their feet down. We teach people to go up their side to slow them down and stop them. So you can't turn them that way. And that's really important to understand. Yeah, it's just real natural for cattle, if you walk up their side, they're just gonna shut down. If you're close enough, it, then that feeling you can go along with the flow of the cattle as long as you're far enough away, they don't see that. It's kind of putting a break on them. And if there's no other cattle up in front of them, yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah, because that draw in front of them will change where you have to be to stop that movement. 